In this video, I'm going to try to articulate why great art doesn't make sense without God. I'll be speaking in broad terms. So in this video, when I say God, I'm referring to a supernatural being that is the moral lawgiver and creator of us and the universe. I'm not necessarily arguing specifically for the Christian God, though that is the God that I choose to believe in and worship. To me, it seems that historically, the best artwork that has ever been created has been created by societies that saw us created in the image of God or created gods in our image. That is, the best works of art were religious in nature. They believed that the gods were like us, that they had bodies like ours, and the biblical tradition starts with the concept that we were created in the image of God, that he created men and women in his image and in his likeness. To me, it seems that these are examples of that spark or that justification that gives artists the license to study and recreate the human figure in a way that cultures that didn't believe these things just didn't. In order to make sense of the concepts in this video, you must first hold the viewpoint that this work of art is absolutely superior to this work of art, and that one is great and the other is not. Now, most people and even young children can intuitively grasp how the first sculpture is clearly better than the second. But justifying this view verbally as an objective truth is much more difficult. If you believe that the first is not objectively greater than the second, and that all art is truly relative, and no work of art is any better or worse than any other work of art, then you believe in artistic relativism, and probably relativism in general. That everything, beauty, art, morality, it's all a matter of opinion. This artistic relativism is best summarized by the ubiquitous art quote, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And on its face, it seems like this is an impossible statement to argue against, but that won't stop me from trying. For example, if 100 people entered a sculpture show with a thousand sculptures, the odds are that each person would find a different sculpture that they believe is the most beautiful or the greatest work of art in the show. And so I believe that drawing a parallel between art and morality is helpful because both deal with hard to define concepts that are full of seemingly gray areas, but are easier to grasp at the extremes when we can distinctly see the contrast between white and black, beautiful and ugly, good and evil. Is it better to give a $10 bill to a homeless person or to spend half an hour helping an elderly woman in her home? Both actions are good, but arguing that one is objectively better than the other would be difficult. However, if I ask, is it better to give $10 to a homeless person or to beat up an elderly woman for your own pleasure, things suddenly become clearer. And arguing that one action is objectively and absolutely superior to the other is much easier, regardless of what anyone says or what society values or how you were raised it is objectively wrong to hurt an innocent person for your own pleasure. Now, I've tried to do the same thing with the two works of art at the beginning. While it might be difficult to argue which is objectively superior, this sculpture by Bernini or this one by Michelangelo, it becomes much easier to argue that this sculpture by Bernini is objectively superior to a Picasso painting. But society rewarded Bernini and Picasso for his painting about equally. So am I saying that one culture was right and one was wrong? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. One society was right, the other was wrong. People and societies can reward bad art, just as societies can reward bad behavior. But rewarding what is bad does not make it good. This says more about the societies and what they valued than whether or not one is better than the other. And one clearly is better than the other. This is why I believe that relativism doesn't hold up. Cultural relativism 
is a popular position to hold that no culture is objectively superior or inferior to another. However, as soon as you start mentioning specific cultures, like the culture of Nazi Germany that engaged in genocide, or the culture of the Aztecs who engaged in human child sacrifice and cannibalism, then it's a little harder to argue that all of these cultures are morally equal to cultures that believe in intrinsic human dignity. Obviously, cultures that hold human beings as intrinsically valuable are superior to cultures that do not. A culture that sacrifices children is worse, objectively worse, and absolutely worse than a culture that does not. To believe in cultural relativism, you must concede that the American Southern slave-holding culture in the 1800s was no better or worse than the Northern American abolitionist culture that fought to free the slaves. That's a hard pill to swallow. So while many people claim that they believe in cultural relativism, when you actually get into specifics or questions of good versus evil, that framework falls apart. I believe that the same is true when you look at the creation of beauty versus the creation of ugliness or the destruction of beauty. When society elevates ugliness to the same level as beauty, then art becomes worse and the world around us becomes uglier. By making the category of art inclusive to the point of including urinals, what actually happens is that the category is destroyed. Now, you may agree that relativism is incorrect, but when you Google what is the opposite of relativism, you find words like absolutism, totalitarianism, autocracy, despotism, dictatorship, which don't sound better and, in fact, seem to be objectively worse than relativism. Though, if you're a relativist, then you can't admit this. You can't admit that one is better than the other. You can't admit that a dictatorship is worse than democracy because it's all culturally relative. Because we live in a relativistic culture, even the words we use to describe objective truth, objective morals, and objective beauty are tainted by our bias against objectivity and our bias against standards that don't change or reshape themselves to fit into the times that we're living in. When we change the definition of terms, which we use to understand the world, such as marriage or the word woman, to also include relationships that are not marriage and people who are not women, we destroy the purpose of the institution or the meaning of the word. Just like if you change the definition of the word banana, to be more inclusive and include all fruits, you don't make the term more inclusive, you destroy the meaning of the word, and communication becomes difficult. So to believe that art is in the eye of the beholder is to believe that art has no purpose or definition. And that is the exact point. To believe that art is completely subjective and that no work of art is any better or worse than any other artwork you must believe that art serves no purpose, that there is no point to art. If there is no point to art, then no work of art is any better or worse than any other. But if art does have a purpose, then you have a framework to judge whether one work of art fulfills that purpose better than another. So you might be thinking, Andrew, this is all well and good, but how does it relate to God? If you believe that mankind are not created for a purpose, but rather that we are a cosmic fluke and that we essentially amount to random bits of matter moving around in an indifferent vacuum of space, that mankind is destined for eternal nothingness after our short lives here on earth, then why would anyone or any society in their right mind spend the time, energy, and effort that it takes to create truly great and meaningful works of art? Biologically, it makes sense to conserve energy and not waste time or energy taking a rock and shaping it into something that has no function to increase our wealth or our likelihood of reproduction. And one of the most famous tropes about artists is that they often are not rewarded during their lifetime for the artwork that they create. Why is a stone sculpture any better than an uncut rock? 
If there is no God and therefore no purpose to life beyond doing what feels good to our natural senses, then why spend the time, energy, and effort to live a moral life or to create beautiful works of art? After all, creating beauty is more difficult than creating something that's ugly and calling it beautiful. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. If, however, there is a God who created the universe and created us, then that God gave us our moral sense as well as our sense of what is beautiful and meaningful. If there is a moral law that dictates that hurting an innocent person for our pleasure is wrong, then that infers a moral law giver who has written that law into our hearts and minds. Therefore, if we feel a purpose-driven mission to create beautiful works of art, this isn't just an illusion or a biological fluke of randed, unguided chemical processes, but it is the sense of an endowment or a gift from someone greater than ourselves and greater than all of mankind. If there is no God, then right and wrong, good and evil, beauty and ugliness are all merely social constructs and no one has the moral authority to claim that any action is superior or inferior to any other action. It's all just a matter of matter bumping into itself, and morality and beauty is all just an illusion. In this world, might makes right. In this world, good and evil are synonymous with popular and unpopular. In this world, the philosophy of sadism makes perfect logical sense. This philosophy is best summed up by the question, why should your pain matter more than my pleasure? If it makes me feel good to harm others and I can get away with it, then why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I do what makes me feel good? This is a perfectly logical position to take if there is no objective morality. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to believe in God in order to create great works of art. There are many atheists and agnostic people who create magnificent works of art and who are much more talented than I am in figurative representation. But what I am saying is that it doesn't make sense to do that. It doesn't make sense to put in the time, effort, and energy into something like representing the human figure if there is no creator and if life doesn't have a meaning beyond here and now. So while we don't have to believe in God to create great works of art or to act morally, if we don't believe in God and yet strive to create great works of art that beautify and if we put in the moral effort to strive to live righteously, we are acting irrationally. We are wasting our time and energy trying to appease a moral sense that is nothing more than chemicals in a meat sack where our time would better be spent fulfilling natural desires and biological urges that require less effort. If there is no God, then life is ultimately meaningless because whatever meaning we believe exists is merely an illusion. Any self-imposed meaning will only last as long as we do. And if there is no God, that is only a blink when compared with the time frame of the universe. If there is no God, then the fate of the most righteous person and the most evil person who have ever lived on the earth is essentially the same. Nothingness and non-existence. The same is true of the greatest work of art and the worst. Nihilism is the logical conclusion of atheism. Nihilism is the belief that nothing really matters in the end, because in the end, we're all dead, we're all stuff. Nihilism leads to the destruction of that which is beautiful and meaningful, and it is not a coincidence that as American culture has become more atheistic, more nihilistic, and more relativistic, we have begun to destroy masterful works of art and replace beauty with ugliness. We've gotten to the point where society believes that if we pretend that a man who believes that he is a woman is an actual woman, then that is what makes him a woman. That if we just act as if it's true, then it becomes true. But it doesn't. Lies don't become true just because we act as if they were true. And when we act out lies and when we act out falsehoods, things become worse. Life becomes worse. Things become ugly, and we go to greater and greater lengths to shut up those who try to speak the truth or try to fight for what is good and beautiful. 
This relativism is where phrases like my truth and your truth come from. The thing about these philosophies is that they make perfect sense if there is no God, and if right and wrong, good and evil, beautiful and ugly are all just social constructs. If it's all just socially constructed, then why shouldn't a man be treated like a woman if that's what he wants, if that's what makes him feel good? Why not? To those who believe in God and an objective reality, the answer is simple, because it's not true. And whether you were born as a man or whether you were born as a woman, this is something that is God-given, and it's good that you're a man or a woman. And it's not good to pretend that you're something that you're not. So it makes sense if there's no God who created us or gave us our moral sense or our intellectual understanding. But objectivity points towards one truth and one reality. So while the picture or reality might be tinted by the personal lens through which you and I view the world, that doesn't change the reality of the world that we're viewing. Great art screams of meaning and purpose and points us towards the transcendent. It transforms ordinary matter into something more than the sum of the components. And by removing material from a stone, we create something more valuable than the stone left alone. Great art says that we are more than animals and that we are something different from an ant or a rock or a tree. Great art says that there is something intrinsically valuable about the human experience that is worth exploring. To quote from one of my favorite lines of my book, An Artist's X-Ray Vision, the artistic portrayal of mankind is a worthwhile endeavor because people are worthy of thorough observation, thoughtful consideration, and timeless representation. I may never be a truly great artist, but my hope is that as I strive to create what is beautiful and to say what I believe to be true, that those actions will have an impact that will live beyond me. I truly believe that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, that we were created for a purpose, and that life does indeed have a meaning. I may be wrong in my beliefs, and I cannot see beyond the veil of death to know for a fact or for a certainty that God and family will be waiting for me, but I'm willing to wager my life and all that I have on the premise that these things are true. May God bless you as you try to discern what is true and to create what is beautiful. If you believe there is something that I got wrong in this video, or if there's a point that I haven't explored or addressed, then I hope you'll join the conversation in the comments below. Stay creative. Stay productive.